The devil has always been a source of fascination in Judeo-Christian belief. He is seen as an all-powerful entity, second only to God. Even Jesus in the Gospels refers to him as Prince of this world. In fact, according to scripture, Jesus himself was offered the greatest bargain of all by the devil when he fasted in the desert. The devil stated that he could give to Jesus all man's authority and splendor, proclaiming that it has been given to me and I can give it to anyone I want to. If Jesus agreed to worship the devil, it would all be his. Jesus refused to be tempted and said no. However, it is claimed that many others after him have said yes and have made their own deals with the devil. Born Gerbert of Auriac, Pope Sylvester II was a Renaissance man hundreds of years before the time, having been born in 946 and dying in 1003. He was a humanist scholar before there was even a term for it, being well read in classic literature and having been an early advocate for the use of the Hindu Arabic numerals that we use today in a Europe that had no mathematical writing system. Amongst his many scholarly accomplishments, he is known for having reintroduced the abacus, an ancient calculating tool used before written numerals, to Europe, and is even noted for having constructed a hydraulic-powered brass organ which was hailed as having surpassed all previously built musical instruments. It was for this and other accomplishments that Gerbert was hailed as one of the pre-eminent scientists of his day. Alongside his fame as a scholar, however, was a belief that he was a sorcerer. It was whispered that he had acquired such occult knowledge during his time spent in the Iberian Islamic Kingdom of Al-Andalus. In the 10th and 11th century, the Kingdom of Al-Andalus was the most enlightened and prosperous kingdom in continental Europe, containing knowledge from across the vast contemporary Islamic world and of the ancient philosophers. To the Christian powers in the rest of Europe, this Arabic kingdom was not only an exotic place, but also a dangerous one. Yet, even then, some Europeans, regardless of their religion, recognized Al-Andalus as the only place to acquire a true education. Such was this recognition that in the Christian monastery in Vic, Catalonia, there were many works imported from the Enlightened Kingdom. It was there that Gerbert acquired his first taste of Arabic culture. From here, he would embark on his travels, journeying through the Muslim lands so as to gain the knowledge that would make him famous. Many tales of Gerbert's genius circulated during and after his lifetime. In the 12th century, the English monk historian William of Malmesbury wrote that during his time in Al Angelus, Gerbert acquired a book of spells from an Arabic philosopher. Contained within this book, it was said, was the knowledge to subdue the devil. According to Malmesbury, the philosopher refused to part with his beloved book. He would sleep with it under his pillow so as to protect it. Gerbert, however, was determined to possess this great tome, so he seduced the man's daughter and learned of its whereabouts. It was then just a simple matter of getting the philosopher drunk and stealing the book. Yet, the philosopher was cunning and had the knowledge to track all things on earth or water. Gerbert, however, was wiser still and was able to trick the man and escape by hanging off a wooden bridge and thereby touching neither earth nor water. With the book now in his possession, it is said that Gerbert was able to contact demons and sell his soul to the devil. This is how, at least according to legend, Gerbert gained the papal throne. According to the tale, there was a caveat to Gerbert's diabolical pact. Should he ever hear mass in Jerusalem, then the devil would come to claim him. With this knowledge, Gerbert, now Pope Sylvester II, was easily able to reject any offers of pilgrimage to the holy city of Jerusalem. With that potentially problematic scenario avoided, he was able to dedicate himself to the luxuries and indulgences afforded to him by his office. Yet, a man of Sylvester's wisdom should have known that a deal with the devil is never so simple to negotiate. 
one day, upon hearing mass in a church in Rome that he learned too late was called the Holy Cross of Jerusalem, he knew that he was doomed, and soon after fell mortally ill. In another version of the legend, the devil came for Sylvester in person, accompanied by a horde of demons. The wayward pope met a grisly end in front of the whole congregation, with Satan's minions given his gouged out eyeballs to play with. In both variants of the legend, the devil's price was paid. According to the law, to this day, Pope Sylvester's very bones are cursed, and are said to rattle in his tomb whenever a pope is about to die. In 1589, King James VI of Scotland, later James I of England, was due to marry Princess Anne of Denmark. As the princess sailed to Scotland, fierce storms raged and forced her and her company to find shelter in Norway. Although James and Anne were eventually wed, the tempest was blamed on malevolent witches, who were said to want to thwart their royal union. Thus, both in Denmark and Scotland, large-scale inquisitions were instigated against suspected sorcerers for two years, with King James himself supervising some of the tortures and examinations that occurred. Amongst those said to be witches was Dr. John Fian. Fian, who went by the alias Cunningham, was discovered with the aid of another, who confessed to the authorities that he too was a practitioner. At first, Fian said nothing at all. The Inquisitors then began the customary torture, starting with one of their milder punishments, which involved thrashing Fian's head with a rope around it. After that, he started to talk. Yet, he provided no coherent confession that satisfied his tormentors. Thus, a torture method known as the boots, which King James describes as the most severe and cruel pain in the world, was employed. Still, Fian was resolute. He would not confess to witchcraft. This prompted a further examination of his body, where it was found that two pine needles had been placed under his tongue. Supposedly, this was a spell cast to prevent him from confessing under torture. With the needles removed, Fian confessed to everything. He stated that his soul belonged to the devil, after having made a covenant with him long ago. It was by serving him that Fian had gained his powers of witchcraft. It was recorded that amongst his powers was the ability to bewitch a gentleman and send him into fits of lunacy. One man who supposedly suffered in this manner was brought before the king's presence on the 24th of December 1590. What the man allegedly did under Fian's command is described in King James's own book, Demonology. Suddenly, he gave a great screech and fell into a madness, sometimes bending himself and sometimes capering so directly up that his head did touch the ceiling of the chamber to the great admiration of his majesty and others then present. When the man was finally worn out by his supposed bewitchment, it took an hour for him to come to his senses and be brought back before the king, only to admit to having no memory of the event. Fian continued to tell other tales of his nefarious witchcraft, which were verified by witnesses in the court. Eventually, he promised to recant his evil ways. He testified that the devil had come to visit him the night before, with a white wand in his hand, trying to persuade him to keep his vow and serve him. Fian said that he castigated the arch fiend, telling him, I utterly forsake thee. The devil then supposedly broke the white wand and said, That once ere thou die, thou shall be mine. Soon after this, Fian managed to steal the keys from his jailer and escape. His freedom did not last long, for the king's men soon caught up with the supposed malefactor and detained him. John Fian then endured more horrendous tortures. This time, however, he confessed to nothing, even after his feet were completely pulverized. When the Inquisition felt nothing else could be gained from their examination, Fian was put to death. In the 17th century, the Dutch were obsessed with speed. Their empire expanded across the world, with colonies on most major continents. One of their most lucrative colonies was in Batavia, 
modern day Jakarta, which had a highly profitable trade in spices. At the time, spices were extremely valuable, being not only used for culinary purposes, but to disguise bad odours and to make medicine. Thanks to the spice trade, the Dutch became a very wealthy empire. However, they were in intense competition with Portuguese and English merchants. Thus, if they could find the fastest routes and employ the most able captains, it would help secure their dominance of the spice trade. At the beginning of the century, a journey from the Netherlands to Indonesia would take around one year. Yet, in 1678, Captain Bernard Folk made that trip in just over three months. At the time, there was no Suez Canal to cut through, so this meant that he had to have somehow sailed around a large part of Europe, along the entire length of Africa, and across the Indian Ocean in a cumbersome wooden ship in a meagre amount of time. This was a speed that would only be beaten in more modern times. For the 17th century, this speed seems unbelievable. However, the sail time was verified by the date stamped on the letters the captain delivered. After his feat, ominous stories started to circulate about the captain, describing him as a severe taskmaster who made serving under him a misery. Then there was an allegation of diabolical treachery. Folk had sold his soul to the devil to be the fastest sailor in the world. It is said that in return for his soul, the devil turned the masts of his ship from wood to iron, and thus he was able to change sails during even the fiercest of storms, something which a wooden mast made very difficult. Thus, with the devil's supposed help and his unyielding leadership, Folk performed one of the fastest voyages of the age. In the centuries since, some have claimed that Folk was the inspiration for the legend of the infamous ghost ship, the Flying Dutchman. For it is said that this swift captain was later ensnared by the devil and made to sail the world's oceans forever under his command. On the 29th of August, 1677, Christoph Heysman was found on the floor convulsing violently whilst he was working in a small castle in Potterbrunn, Austria. The authorities took him in for questioning, initially believing him to be bewitched and that he himself was possibly a witch. There was a reason for the authorities' paranoia. This was the age of witch hunts. In nearby Salzburg, such inquests were commonplace and would continue to be until 1690, claiming more than a hundred lives in the process. Hazeman was initially in very real danger, yet the story that he told the authorities quickly made them reassess the situation. He explained that he was not bewitched, but rather, he had made a deal with the devil and was now demonically possessed. Hazeman explained that nine years ago the devil appeared to him whilst he was an impoverished painter. The devil tempted him repeatedly, hounded him, offering him money, power and women, until finally, he succumbed on the ninth temptation. The reason he finally agreed to strike a deal was because the devil promised to cure his depression, which he had suffered since the recent loss of his father. Two packs were then supposedly signed between him and the devil, one in ink, the other in blood. Hazeman pledged in those agreements that in return he would give himself, body and soul, to the devil in nine years' time on the 24th of September. At the time of his arrest, this was only a few weeks away. When the local Catholic priest, Leopold Braun, heard Hazeman's story, he took pity on him, describing him as a miserable man. The priest wrote to a nearby abbey and asked them to assist him. They, in due course, accepted Hazeman, and the monks there started to perform severe exorcisms. Hazeman was dutifully penitent and did everything they told him, Yet, at midnight on the 8th of September, he met the devil again. The monks attested that, whilst holding him in a state of agony, Hazeman freed himself and ran to their chapel, only to return with a piece of paper some time later. Hazeman claimed that the piece of paper was the contract written in blood many years ago. He said that he had snatched the accursed pact from the very claws of the devil, who appeared to him in the form of a winged dragon. The monastery popularised his case as a miracle, however, it was not to last, 
for by the 11th of October, Hazeman's convulsions were back. Not only that, they were worse than ever, sometimes leaving him entirely paralysed. During these episodes, he later testified to being tormented not only by the devil, but by the Virgin Mary and Christ. The devil with his customary temptations, and Christ and Mary demanding he renounce worldly possessions and become a man of God. Again, Hazeman underwent exorcisms, and this time received the pact he had made in ink from the devil. After this, he joined a monastery and became a monk. There, he completed several paintings of the devil in his different incarnations, including an especially grand piece in which he painted the Virgin Mary, helping him to retrieve the pact in ink from the devil. The torments, however, never stopped. They would plague Hazeman for the rest of his life, until he died in the year 1700, peaceful and of good comfort. One of the most prominent blues musicians of the early 20th century was Tommy Johnson. He was part of a musical movement known as the Delta Blues, so called for originating in the region of the Mississippi Delta of the United States. This movement was also known by another name, the Devil's Blues, for many believed that the music and its artists were closely associated with the Devil. Some had even come to believe that artists, like the unrelated blues musician Robert Johnson, had to have sold their souls in order to gain such mastery over the guitars which made them famous. Whilst many claim that it was Robert Johnson who began the legend of selling one's soul to the devil to play the blues, one of his biographers, Tom Graves, stated in 2008 that this story actually originated with Tommy Johnson and was later ascribed to Robert. And, Tommy was indeed a perfect candidate for such a damnable pact. He was a troubled soul and a chronic alcoholic. He had, however, been somewhat commercially successful during his lifetime, with hits like Canned Heat Blues, a song about drinking methanol from the cooking fuel sterno. His live performances were said to be legendary, inspiring the flamboyant antics of later rock and roll artists. He was known to play the guitar behind his neck, in between his legs, and in mid-air. Aside from his guitar, Tommy's voice was unique and incredibly difficult for anyone to imitate, for he was able to express a wide range of vocal tones effortlessly. People at the time started to believe that such great ability must have come from the devil himself. This idea became all the more popular when Tommy himself began to confirm the claim. Some time after Tommy's death, in 1966, his brother Ledol Johnson stated in an interview with Tommy's biographer, David Evans, that Tommy had in fact told him about his pact with Satan personally. Not only that, Tommy has supposedly described how anyone could sell their soul to the devil. Now if Tommy was living, he'd tell you. He said the reason he knew so much was because he sold himself to the devil. I asked him how. He said, if you want to learn how to play anything, you want to play and learn how to make songs yourself, you take your guitar and you go to where a road crosses that way, where a crossroads is. Get there, be sure to get there just a little before 12 that night, so you'll know you'll be there. You have your guitar and be playing a piece there by yourself. A big black man will walk up there and take your guitar and he'll tune it, and then he'll play a piece and hand it back to you. That's the way I learned to play anything I want. Ledol Johnson had been a blues musician himself, occasionally performing alongside his brother. In his older years, something about the music and his lifestyle made him turn to the church and become a man of God, believing, like many in the area, that blues was the work of the devil. Whilst Tommy only left behind a small number of recorded works, they are considered masterpieces, with the vinyl records he released at the time now considered precious treasures. In 2013, one of his original singles sold on eBay for over $37,000, making it the most expensive 78 RPM record ever sold at the time. It would seem that at least in the case of Tommy Johnson, the devil certainly held up his end of the bargain. Thank you for watching. 
If you enjoyed this video, please like and subscribe for more of the paranormal if you have not done so already. And if you cannot wait until my next upload, why not watch another diabolical themed video suggested on screen now? You can also learn more about witchcraft trials in the time before Salem. Until next time.